Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar on polymers with the today's topic, Cure Monitoring of Coatings, Resins and Adhesives with Dielectric Analysis. To today's agenda, there are five topics. The first one is the application for Cure Monitoring in Plastics Industry, where I will describe where we can use this technology, Dielectric Cure Monitoring. The second one is I will explain the measurement principle of dielectric analysis. How does the technology work? The third one is actually uh, what kind of solutions does NET offer for cure monitoring by DEA? Fourth topic is probably the most interesting one for you as uh, your listeners, the application examples. Afterwards, I'm going to summarize it and I could have added a sixth point, meaning questions and answers afterwards. In the industry, in thermal, thermal sets industry, um, we have a workflow, a, a kind of a classical workflow um, to characterize the properties of a cross-linking or a thermal set system. This means at first there's always the step formulation of a resin of a hardener adi with adi added modifiers. Afterwards there's the processing step where we apply heat and cure the material in a process to create a part or to paint a part, to cover, to coat a part. Out of this we receive a final product that offers kind of specific structure property relationships. For the resin formulation uh, recipe definition, we uh, it's very, it's quite uh, well established to use the DSC, differential scanning calorimetry, uh, as a method to characterize the reactivity or to characterize the glass transition of a resin or a, a curing system. Additionally, rheology is well, very well established and, and uh, also others like mechanical testing or DMA. In this field, the DEA is capable to cover the to give information about reactivity as well as the change of viscosity of a formulation in a lab scale. Coming to the next step in the workflow, the processing, um, those classical lab scale characterization technologies are not, cannot be applied. Besides DEA, DEA is a measurement technology that has its strength in the lab to create neat resins, uh, to, to characterize neat resins, and it has its strength also in the processing, to monitor during processing with specific sensors the viscosity, flow front and infusion processes to monitor reactivity or the degree of curing in a process. Uh, and the final part, we come back to classical analyzing technologies. Here DA does not have its strength uh, anymore that much. We can characterize a glass transition with DA, but DSC, DMA, or a laser flash analysis have uh, their strength on the cured on the final part. The general question is uh, why do we need or why do you need cure monitoring? Cure monitoring can actually be applied in different areas of, an, of a company. One is quality control of incoming goods. This means um, is the material delivered the one that it expected? Can we character how to characterize it? We need to characterize the curing. Um, we have to under before processing. Usually, we have to understand the resin's behavior in the application at which temperature does do we have to cure the material? At which temperature um, or after how long do we have to cure at a specific time? This brings us to the point: we need cure monitoring to assure the quality of our products or of your products. And there will arise a number of questions like which time and which temperature is necessary to start the curing process? What's the optimum curing process? I mean, which time temperature profile do we have to choose to cure correctly? And is the resin selected or the resin delivered the correct, the best one for the process? Or are there, is there a potential to improve? And how can I compare the reactivity of the resins? Is it curing faster or slower compared to others? And after the processing, there's always a question, is there a tendency for post-curing effect in the part? So is it not completely cured? 
many many questions and if you have a look on the picture on the right hand side this uh, woman's eye is looking onto a flowing resin um, and this woman has several, those questions she asked those questions and how can we answer her questions here again uh, a little bit bigger the the, the flowing resin and the, the questioning eye of this uh, beautiful woman. One way to go is DSC, differential scanning calorimetry. With this technology we can characterize glass transitions, we can characterize the heat of curing and the, also the reactivity of the resin. But it is limited to, uh, to, a, to, a, to the laboratory scale. Another methodology is rheology, where we characterize the viscosity eta as a function of time, frequency, and temperature. Both very well established techniques to characterize resins. DMA, dynamic mechanical analysis, is suitable to characterize as the, 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 the curing of a resin with specific sample holders, as well to characterize the uh, cured part, like storage modulus or loss modulus and to characterize the glass transition of the cured resin and we can could also characterize the mechanical properties of the resin in terms of the elastic modulus strength elongation at break or the k1c factor is a fracture mechanics factor within this area actually DEA is in this field is one additional technology, but it has its strength as well as in the lab, in the laboratory as well as in the process itself. And with dielectric analysis, we can uh, add more information to the one to the four uh, classical characterization techniques that are, are surrounding the picture. Comparing DMA to dielectric uh, dynamic mechanic analysis to um, dielectric analysis, there are some sim similarities, but there are also uh, many differences. In DMA, we apply a dynamic force, and we measure a deformation of the of a sample, for instance. With DEA, we don't apply mechanical force; we apply electrical voltage, and what we measure is we measure a current an electrical current. Out of this we can calculate dielectric uh, constants, dielectric properties uh, like dielectric constant permittivity in the dynamic in the DMA we measure mod modulus, the stiffness of the sample, the change of stiffness as a function of time and temperature. With DEA we measure the dielectric properties of the material and we measure also the loss factor. I will explain those later. Uh, we measure the tangents delta, for instance, uh, as a function of time shift or frequency shift. Uh, DMA has a kind of limitation in terms of frequencies. DA has a, can cover a wide range of frequencies to give uh, a lot of information. It has a high data acquisition rate, so we can measure really fast reactions, very, very fast reactions, and we can measure multiple samples in parallel and with DMA in the lab we can only measure one sample in parallel one sample each time um, multiple sample testing for DA might be interesting if you work with um, rotor blades for wind uh, craft wind, wind force plants um, where we have rotor blades with a length of up to 50 meters and if you're interested in the curing behavior in such a huge part then DEA is a way to go to characterize this and then you need maybe up to 16 channels to characterize the materials behavior. You know. Coming to the next topic in our agenda, this is the measurement principle of dielectric analysis. The fundamental principle of dielectric analysis is that we have let's say a plate capacitor in an anode as well as a cathode and in this anode and between anode and cathode there is a, 
a polymer, a resin, an uncured resin or a coating, a paint. And in this resin we have dipoles and we have ions that can move around freely within the liquid. If we have no electrical field, the dipoles behave as they want. But if we apply an, electric, an external electrical field in the capacitor, we have an alignment of the dipoles and we, we create a mob mobility of ions. The mo ions are moving more or less, cations are moving to the uh, negative pole and the anions and ions are moving to the positive uh, pole. And this is what we really measure with the dielectric analysis. We measure the movability of the dipoles the, and the induction of dipoles and we measure the movability, mobility of ions. And this we don't do with a, with a, a constant voltage. We apply a sinusoidal voltage as we can see on the right hand, uh, right hand side picture uh, to the capacitor and then we measure the current, the response current um, the res and the response current simply depends on the attenuated this uh, depends on the alignment and the mobility of dipoles and ions respectively. We have to look at some equations unfortunately, I'm sorry for that uh, but what is happening in the dielectric analysis is when the, mo when, the, when, the, when the dielectric properties of the polymer changes due to the electrical field, the capacity of the capacitor changes, of course, and this is defined as the C capacity zero without any sample in between and the dielectric constant of the resin and the epsilon r. And the epsilon r consists of a real part, epsilon r dash, and an imaginary part, epsilon r double dash or prime and double prime. Epsilon prime is more or less the permittivity of the, or the dielectric constant. It it's a measure of the alignment and the number of dipolar groups in a material. So if we have more dipolar groups in a material, the permittivity is increasing, and if we have less, it's decreasing. Very important for the characterization of the curing is the loss factor, actually, epsilon double prime. It measures at the total energy lost due to the work performed aligning dipoles and moving ions in the material. This means if we apply an electrical field, the ions and dipoles start to move and this consumes energy. And if we have curing, so we have cross-linking progress from covalent bondings in the resin, then the movability of the dipoles as well as the ions is dramatically re reduced. And this is measured by the epsilon double prime by the loss factor. And this is a very important characteristic. The movability is decreasing and the loss factor is simply decreasing as the movability of ions and dipoles is very low. Then we can additionally calculate the tangens delta, which is the uh, is this epsilon double prime divided by epsilon prime, which is also important, but I won't go too much in detail on that today. The principle is that usually um, we have a diagram here. We have a temperature from minus 40 to plus 40 degrees, for instance, and we have here the loss factor. So the loss factor is a measure for the energy loss in the material when the ions and the dipoles are moving due to the electrical field. And the loss factor is, is, has several influencing factors. Um, it depends definitely on the temperature of the thermosetting thermo resin. Um, at lower temperatures, the dipoles in the resin um, dominate uh, in contrast to at higher temperatures the movability of the ion conductivity, the uh, contribution of the ions is dominating. Uh, additionally, we have an influence of frequency in the loss factor. So um, with a low frequency we can characterize the conduct conduction very well of the, of, of, the, of the ions. With a higher frequency we can characterize the dipolar correct character better. But we need both. For instance, me, but I will come back to this later. 
Unfortunately, I have to bother you with one page of equations additionally. I introduced the loss factor, the epsilon double prime. Out of this loss factor and the frequency applied of the sinusoidal voltage and epsilon zero, we can calculate a sigma. Sigma is not a stress in this case, it's the ion conductivity, the, the conductivity of the ions in the resin. The unit is Siemens per meter and we can use this as an as an as the as an information on the conductivity of ions meaning with an increasing uh, cross-linking degree the conductivity is decreasing as well as the epsilon double prime the loss factor is decreasing what we are actually interested in for Q monitoring mostly is the so-called ion viscosity here the ion viscosity is the inverse of the ion conductivity. It's defined as phi, and you have to get familiar, if you work with DEA, you have to get familiar with the ion viscosity of the resin. Um, and the ion viscosity is a calculated value out of the frequency and the loss factor. What we can see here is a typical picture of a measurement, of a curing of a thermoset temp material at a constant temperature. What we see here, we have ion viscosity as well as the loss, the blue, the red curves, the loss factor are the blue curves and we have uh, the time. So we have isothermal temperature, let's say room temperature and we start, the material starts to cure and what happens is that in general the loss factor epsilon double prime is decreasing as the movability of the ions on the dipoles is decreasing and this means that this means that at low frequency uh, that, that uh, at the beginning when the resin is still a liquid we have a high loss factor and at a higher degree of curing after a certain time we have a low loss factor this is already influenced um, by the by the frequency so especially at what what we recommend is at when the resin is very liquid not cured we usually have a we can use a higher frequency and when the resin ha offers a higher degree of curing um, then the lower frequency is the way to go out of the loss factor we can calculate the ion viscosity, a logarithmic ion viscosity in the unit ohm centimeter and what and there we see characteristic points which I will explain to you. So we have a minimum of the ion viscosity due to a temperature increase, due to a reactivity, heat release during curing. Then we have an onset of curing after 4.8 minutes in this case. Then that ion viscosity is dramatically increasing over four decades after 11 minutes in this case we have reached already a high degree of curing and in the next uh, 30 minutes to the end the degree of the iron viscosity is not changing too much in this case. So this shape of the iron viscosity uh, will look in a si rather similar for the next examples. Here I will explain it again in detail on this uh, with co ion viscosity curve, how we can, uh, what characteristic values can be measured out of the by dielectric analysis? Ion viscosity over time, we see here, after is a very fast curing resin. After 17 seconds, we have a minimum in ion viscosity, which correlates act actually to the, uh, which correlates actually to the minimum to best rheological flow behavior. So we have a it's, it's not the same values, of course. Rheological flow as well as ion viscosity, rheological viscosity as ion viscosity are different parameters, but they correlate. So the ion viscosity by dielectric analysis gives also an information on the minimum ion with minimum rheological viscosity. Then we have an increase of uh, the ion viscosity and the slope of the increase gives an information how fast the curing takes place, how fast the reactivity is. Then 
we level uh, we we reach a horizontal level. Um, this gives us information of the state of curing, or when the when the when the uh, level is completely horizontal, the curing has finished under those conditions, and we see a dramatic increase of iron viscosity due to the increased cross-linking density. This means the movability of the ions and the dipoles has been reduced due to the higher degree of cross-linking. This gives us a higher ion viscosity and this is what we are interested in to see how high the ion viscosity is as a function of time and temperature. To measure, to characterize I, uh, dielectric properties of a resin for Q monitoring, uh, you need instruments, you need technology for that, and NET offers a wide range of technologies, which I will explain to you right now. Recently, or not recently, two years ago, NET has introduced a new dielectric analyzer, 288 Epsilon is its name, and it is available in different kinds of housings. This means we have a laboratory version, which is uh, looks a little bit familiar with our DSC and our TG and our LFA instruments, so for a lab for lab use. Um, inside of the of the dielectric analyzer we have uh, up to eight channels where we can measure eight samples in parallel or a big part at different locations. We have eight DA signals, we have eight uh, temperature channels we can cover a wide range of frequencies, megahertz to millihertz to megahertz, 10 to the power 9 decades. Uh, each channel is working independently, so we have a real true multi-channel support. The data acquisition is very fast, so we can characterize very fast systems. And the system is also capable to communicate with surrounding equipment, uh, in the lab as well as, uh, for instance, for a injection machine or infusion machines for RTM processes for a, com for a press, compression press, for instance. Additionally, NET offers an uh, industry version which supports up to 16 channels. The electronics in there is the same. We just offer it in a different housing which has a more robust character and this can be used in the factory, in the plant, to characterize the cure to, char to, cure, to characterize the cure monitoring during um, the processing of a resin, during painting, during coating, during adhesive applications. And we have a smaller industry version. It's called a slim version. This is the same electronics, but it uh, has only two channels. For to, when you're interesting to start up with this technology, a lot of people go for a two-channel version to have an instrument that is working perfectly, but is only equipped with two channels. Besides the instrument itself, uh, you have to get familiar with the DA sensors. Um, as mentioned before, the plate condensator uh, uh, on the left-hand side, I've introduced before that we have parallel plate electrodes, an anode and a cathode. In between, there might be a polymer sample. This is not very uh, feasible for curing for cure monitoring. This is why we introduce co so-called comp electrodes. They are have an anode and a cathode, but they are arranged on a, on a plane. So they're called interdigital coplanar uh, arrangement of the anode and the cathode. The difference in general is if you have a parallel plate electrodes, you apply the electrical field in a bulk, in a complete volume of the sample. Uh, in contrast to this, with a fringe so-called interdigital coplanar arrangement of the electrodes, you have a fr so-called fringe field where the electrical field is not penetrating the bulk material totally, but um, the electrical feed lines are here as you can see here. And the depth, the meaning how deep the electrical field is penetrating into the electrical, into the polymer, depends on the spacing, on the distance between the anode and the cathode. For the sensors, NET offers two kinds of sensors in general. We use 
A, a reusable sensor. A reusable sensor can be put into a mold, for instance, for compression molding, for RTM, SMC, BMC, or polyurethane processes, or even for autoclaves. This it can be run up to 220 degrees. It's high mechanical resistance due to pressure. It's a thermocouple integrated, and it can be reused again and again. So investment once, but you can use it over years to characterize in one mold at one specific location. In contrast to that, there are dispose, so-called disposable sensors. This disposable sensor is an electronic capaci electric capacitor printed on a polymer film, and we call it the interdigitated electrode, or shortly the IDEX electrode, or the, the IDEX sensor. And this IDEX sensor is not; it, it can be used once for curing. Cure monitoring, it, but it has a wide application field. It can be used for adhesives, paints, inks, coatings, resins, and thermoset composites. It can be used as well in the laboratory, in the laboratory as well as in the in the industrial applications. And there are different types of interdigitated electrodes available. The temperature range is higher, 375 degrees. Also available with integrated thermocouple, for instance. Here we have a more detailed look on this IDEX COMP sensors, the interdigitated electrode. There, there here we sh show our standard COMP sensor, which is very robust, which is disposable after usage. And aligning the distance of the anode and the cathode in this example is 150 micrometers. And this is a standard sensor. There are IDEX sensors available which have a smaller distance between the electrode, between the lines, um, for especially for coatings or paints. If you work with uh, carbon fiber reinforced composites or highly filled uh, carbon black filled composites, you have to take care a little bit um, that you don't create a short circuit on the, on the electrode on the IDEX sensor, and this is why we offer the so-called filtered IDEX sensor. The filtered IDEX sensor is an IDEX sensor where we have applied a thin glass fiber fabric which keeps away the conductive filler but the neat resin can penetrate through the glass mesh and we can measure also carbon fiber reinforced composites with this kind of filtered IDEX sensor. Here we have an overview of accessories available from NETCH. Besides the instrument, the lab version of the DEA-288, we offer a multifunctional lab furnace. This multifunctional lab furnace uh, that we can apply controlled heating or cooling rates. We can create atmospheres like oxidizing or nitrogen atmosphere. And this is usually used in the laboratory to characterize the resin as a function of time and temperature. To the, to the lab furnace, you can, if you're interested, you can connect a UV lamp for uh, UV curing systems, like UV curing adhesive, I will show you an example later, and there is a humidity generator available if you're interested to create specific kind of uh, water containing atmospheres. If you work with composites and you're interested to characterize the, com the, the properties of a composite material, we have a pneumatic lab press that can be heated to create small specimen or coupons that, and with a parallel measurement of di the dielectric properties. A detailed look into the furnace can be seen on the next slide. Here we have the, the lid opened from the furnace and the furnace goes up to 400 degrees C, can run controlled heating or cooling rates and here we see a uh, so-called IDEX sensor mounted inside of the, of, the, of the DA furnace. Here on this area we apply um, a, resin, a resin and then we close the lid, start the measurement program and we record uh, dielectric properties of the resin as a function of time, of time and temperature. 
A detailed look inside of the laboratory press can be seen on the next slide. Here we have the tool mount, so-called tool mount sensor integrated inside of a small cavity, in the, inside of a small mold. And this one is really suitable to process SMC, BMC, or, carbon, or even reinforced preprex, thermoset preprex. And you will receive out of this uh, some kinds of a sample that can be characterized mechanically afterwards, for instance. So this means NAT offers a wide range of solutions for uh, the Q-monitoring of thermosetting materials in three steps. First one is in the resin formulation that we offer in DA instruments, a DA furnace, a wide range of sensors. Uh, it can be coupled with for UV curing, for instance. Um, you can uh, characterize your uh, inst your resin completely with those the solution. Then we offer a solution for the, we call it coupon testing or specimen creation, where we can mold uh, under defined conditions, temperature, pressure, time, uh, specimen, and record during this the the record the curing. And we can go in a composite industry or a painting industry, apply sensors like DEA sensor, for instance, uh, tool mount sensor or IDEX sensor inside of the cavity to measure the infusion process, the, the flow front progress of the resin during penetration of the resin. And this is so. In, in the, for an thermal analysis technology. Um, DA gives a solution that leaves the laboratory and goes into the industrial process to measure what is happening there. Coming to the examples, the first one is um, on a powder coating material. In this case, we have chosen an example of a hybrid powder coating consisting of epoxy PES blend. Uh, polyether sulfone. The advantages of that kind of powder coating is it offers superior mechanical properties in terms of hardness and scratch resistance and it has a very good temperature, corrosion as well as weathering resistance. So this is why it's chosen for rough applications for instance, this powder coating. If you want to apply the powder coating you, you want you have to be sure, you have to be familiar with the way how curing takes place in the side of this epoxy powder coating. Uh, what we have done in the lab with a D, with a DA furnace, we have chosen three samples. Uh, we, we have th done three experiments. With our furnace has been set to 140, 150 or 160 degrees Celsius. And the, uh, we have used an IDEX sensor which has been placed inside of the heated or the preheated furnace and we apply cold powder coating on the on the preheated IDEX sensor. What we measure, let's have a look on the green line. This is the one with 160 degrees. <coughs> the iron viscosity is at the beginning dramatically uh, decreasing. Why? The powder is softening and creating a liquid this brings us to the point that we have a dramatic change in ion viscosity, of course, due to this dramatic change in, in, in phase state from a solid powder to a liquid. And then we reach a minimum. We reach a minimum um, of ion viscosity where the material is molten and curing has not yet started. And then the curing or the cross-linking starts of the material and then we see a steady increase of the iron viscosity and already after our, let's say um, 15 minutes uh, we have reached already a reasonable increase of iron viscosity but then we still have in the next 45 minutes still a, a further progress in curing. Um, for instance with rheology we, what, would we, what, what you could measure is a behavior like this. So if we would measure eta for, for viscosity, it would look like some, something like this, that the viscosity is, going, is shooting up, it's going high, but we won't get any information on um, the curing 
the further progress in curing after the solidification of the material. But this means with dielectric analysis we get a good information on how the curing progresses. This means the cross-linking increases which results in a higher glass transition temperature of the material. Additionally, what can be seen here? We have different temperatures and this means that with higher temperatures the value of the ion viscosity is also increasing. This means higher temperature for this material results in a higher ion viscosity finally results in a higher glass transition temperature. Coming to the next example from composite industry resin transfer molding. Here I try to explain that for to those of you who are not familiar with um, we're not familiar with uh, RTM or resin transfer molding as an out of, out of autoclave uh, process. We have a mold. On this mold, we you have to apply a release agent. And first, this is very thin coating. Then you introduce a dry preform. These are fibers arranged in like a non-crimp fabric arrangement, for instance. Then you close the mold. In the third step, you inject a resin into the into the cavity and you infiltrate the non-crim fabric or the dry preform with the resin. Then after the infiltration has finished, the curing starts, the cross-linking starts and then after a certain time at a constant temperature there is the demolding step. So the question is simply when is injection of the of the resin finished, when does curing start and when can we demold our part? Application for RTM process are recently for instance the new BMW i3 series which has a carbon fiber reinforced uh, chassis made by RTM. How to address this problem? We can use a so-called tool mount sensor, a tool mount sensor that can be incorporated into a cavity which can be seen here. We use this snatch tool mount sensor which is very robust, put it in the mold, it's always at the same location and then we can monitor these uh, individual steps. Here we see again our typical curve, the ion viscosity over time and we have a really fast curing material in this case, it's an epoxy resin, two component epoxy resin. And what we see after the infusion has finished, already after 38 seconds, we received uh, the minimum of the ion viscosity. This means that we have the lowest viscosity, rheological viscosity also of the material. And in this case we see then the curing is, has not yet started. 60 seconds later, one minute later, at 98.1 seconds, we can calculate this end set here where the a big step of the curing has already finished and we receive a dramatic increase on ion viscosity measured directly in the mold next on the in the in the cured part and then we see okay afterwards there is still a small increase in in terms of ion viscosity but this small increase actually is not uh not, not, not only a little, it's a lot. The ion viscosity increases by the, again, in the next four minutes or three minutes um, from on a 2.5 fold degree. So this means we still, after this, we still have a steady increase of ion viscosity resulting in a higher glass transition temperature. And with a dielectric analysis, you're able to see what is happening inside of your cavity. You're able to see what is happening inside of your mold to create uh, fiber reinforced composites with thermoset matrix systems. Alternatively, an alternative to the tool mount sensor is the so-called IDEX sensor. Here we have an example from uh, aircraft industry we have a carbon fiber reinforced plastic material which has been created in the RTM process and now we use the IDEX sensor instead of the tool mount sensor and we use three IDEX sensors actually and we put them at different locations in the part at different thickness on the top 
on the middle layer and on the bottom layer. And with the IDEX sensor, we get a local information through the thickness of the part, and we can clearly see what is happening at a function of time and temperature inside of the part that has to be cured. Um, the red line here um, is the middle layer. The cavity is first at a temperature of 120 degrees, afterwards it's heated to a temperature of 180 degrees. For, in the, for the infusion step, we have 120 degrees, for instance. And then we see in the middle layer that the, the iron viscosity is always higher compared to the bottom and the top layer. Why is this so? At first, the heating applied uh, by the mold to the resin uh, receives the inner, inner layer later due to the far distance to the mold surface. And then we have a reaction taking place, an exothermic curing reaction. This means in this case that uh, the heat created by curing cannot be transferred away so fast by the mold. And this is why we have a faster curing inside of in the middle of the part compared to the bottom and the top layer. This means the curing has a, f a faster progress in the middle and the bottom and the top layer of the part have not such a fast curing. This means we have to wait a longer time, up to 240 minutes in this specific case, until the whole part has been completely cured and the three uh, positions receive the same degree of iron viscosity. Next example is the topic Q monitoring of an adhesive. Uh, again, an epoxy example, this iron has been cured at room temperature and we use again the IDEX sensor in a DEA furnace uh, at room temperature. What we can see here is a, the increase of iron viscosity again, that we have a minimum of iron viscosity of after 1.2 minutes. We have an increase uh, uh, up to four decades, uh, uh, around uh, two and a half decade after nine mi uh, minutes, and then we still have a steady increase in the next 20 minutes to a final degree of iron viscosity. So the blue line here is the differentiation of the iron viscosity. This gives us information on the reactivity. Here we have a maximum of reactivity after 6.5 minutes and then the reactivity is decreasing slowly but it's not go coming down to zero up to maybe 20 minutes so we need at least 20-25 minutes to receive a complete curing of the material and this is a way how we can characterize this with the IDEX sensor. The next example I want to uh, show you or the last example more or less for today is the thing, the UV curing of an adhesive. UV is ultraviolet light that is used to cure uh, materials or adhesives and the advantages in general for this are we have is there a high speed of curing, it's only a low energy amount of energy required, no heat is required and we for instance you also have no usually no solvents in those kind of adhesives. Um, there are different kind, types of UV curing systems available, Radical, radically curing UV systems which are very fast, cationic UV systems that are fast and there are also dual cure systems available, it means that we have UV light as well as heat in a combination. Um, so NET offers, as I had mentioned before, uh, combination within the DEA furnace and the and the UV lamp that can be connected to the DEA furnace and by this we can characterize paints, coatings, adhesives, I haven't written inks here but also uh, UV active inks can be uh, characterized in a dielectric way by the, by, by, the, by our instruments. What happen, is happening inside of the, of the material of the adhesive uh, we have a UV curing uh, material which is applied to, to bond to two parts. We have 
resin in, in there and we have a photo initiator in there. When light is applied, um, we create cations, for instance, and those cations, cations uh, deliver, uh, lead to a curing reaction. And then, then the curing starts and we receive a degree of cross-linking. And the advantage is that this is really fast. It's really fast as the curing takes place inside of the volume of the material as the light is penetrating it. Here we have a measurement example measured in the uh, DEA furnace at room temperature. This is 20 degrees Celsius with an IDEX sensor. The resin has room temperature the, and the furnace has room temperature. And what we see here is the ion viscosity over time. And what in this specific sample, three irradiations have taken place, each for 10 seconds. So light has, the, the sample is irradiated for 10 seconds, then the light is turned off, waited some time, again 10 seconds, and then a third time 10 seconds. And what we see here dramatically is the, the green line here, that the ion viscosity when the irradiation takes place is decreasing a lot due to a uh, sudden increase in temperature, so the temperature increase leads to a decrease in ion viscosity, then the curing due to the light takes place, which is really fast, only a few seconds, and it reaches a dramatic higher degree of curing and as we repeat this second irradiation we have an exothermic curing reaction which increases the temperature for some degrees, 3-4 degrees and then um, actually the curing starts and within 3-4 minutes we, we can receive with UV curing a completely cured um, adhesive system which is very fast and only very little energy is required for this and by DA we can really characterize it very easily and see what is happening due to the irradiation to the ion viscosity and to the state of curing. So well, um, I'd like to summarize my talk. What are the benefits actually of the DEA? The DEA itself offers a high degree of user friendliness as it is very easy to, it can be applied very fast it can be operated very easily it gives you fast information of the properties of your curing system and it's by this it's really cost saving to characterize a, a thermoset system by DA uh, of course net offers leading technology we offer an easy instrument with an easy to operate software, we offer a wide frequency range in our electronic devices and we offer a wide range of versatile sensors for different kind of applications. With this technology you're able to apply it during your R&D process in the lab and in the production, in the lab mainly for recipe de development and basic recipe uh, resin characterization and you can use it also in the process to monitor the curing of your painting process, coating process, um, composite process or comparable processes and out of this you can monitor the quality of your part instantly in Z2. We offer this wide range of uh, instruments that are suitable for a wide range of applications. I won't go too much into detail right now. So dielectric analysis itself for Q monitoring is a versatile as well as a complementary to other thermoanalytical methods such as DSC or DMA. So standalone is not the way to go, but DA gives you much more information also during the process. Um, Along with the DIA electronics and the comprehensive software, various sensors are available that are really tailored to specific kind of applications. Please check our website to get more information on other applications. Uh, the new DA Epsilon is not restricted to the lab scale. It can be used in, for in situ monitoring uh, industrial processes like RTM, SMC or UV curing paints or adhesives. Attention must be taken if you work with carbon fiber reinforced plastics that you use filtered IDEX sensors or even coated tool mount sensors 
to avoid sh electrical short circuits. And with the DA itself, you cannot only monitor the curing process, but you also can optimize the curing process in order to achieve high quality products. So it's a very versatile technology use can, that, which can be used to characterize thermosets. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to um, give you now the possibility to ask questions.